A warm welcome to you all today. We thank the Lord that in this situation we can, t- we can continue to gather for worship and lift up our praises and our hearts to the living God. A warm welcome to our congregation, to those who are um, watching this. Um, we're not from our congregation. We thank the Lord that you, he has brought you here, that we can worship together. And also the United Reformed Church in Thunder Bay. A warm welcome to you all as well. A couple of announcements. One is that we will have a Good Friday service. It will be streamed this coming Friday at 10 a.m. You can catch that here. And even though we do not have offerings this time during COVID-19, we are still going to announce the offerings that can be given online for particular kingdom causes. And this morning's offering is for Ontario Christian Gleaners. As we gather now for worship, our opening songs are number 347, There is a Green Hill Far Away, and 27B, verses 1, 5, and 6, Jehovah is my light.
Our Lord God now calls us to worship with these words from Psalm 116, and verse 12 we read, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call in the name of the Lord. I'll pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship with a moment of silent prayer. If you desire, you may stand to worship the Lord. And let us confess, congregation, in whom is your help? Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let us now lift up our hearts to the Lord and receive now his greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening song of praise is taken from Psalm 116. It's 116b, verses 1 to 7. I love the Lord, the fount of life and grace. This morning we turn in the Word of God to Exodus chapter 20. Each week we read the Law of God, the Ten Commandments from from Exodus 20 or Deuteronomy 5 to remind us of our great need of a Savior. And as those whose life and faith is found in Jesus Christ through through His finished work, we have here a guide for Christian living and thankfulness. And even as we think about the situation of our world and the need of our world to repent of sins, And God's mighty acts, let us humble ourselves before God as we hear his word. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you should not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, 
your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who's within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Our Lord Jesus Christ summarized that law when he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is the first and the great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On those two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Well, let us respond to God's law by singing number six. O Lord, in wrath rebuke me not. Number six. There we're singing from Psalm 6 is a psalm of lament, a psalm of crying out to God because of sins, because of enemies, and it's a rightful thing to do, that in the life of the believer that we do lament at times, we do grieve, and as we see sin in this world, we grieve over that as well. We grieve over those who perish in unbelief, perish everlastingly. We grieve for our family members who do not know Christ. And we hold to the truth, to the very hope of the gospel of our salvation, the good news, 
that Jesus Christ has come to solve the problem of sin, to die for sinners, that if you believe in him, you have everlasting life. Our assurance of God's grace comes from 1 John chapter 1, these well-known words, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, if we will but humble ourselves before God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And the reason why? It's because what the next chapter says in verse 1. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That if you believe in Jesus Christ, all of your sins are forgiven. You're granted a, a perfect standing before God, the standing of Jesus Christ. And forevermore, you'll be found to be in his grace. Trust in the Lord and be assured that all of your sins are indeed forgiven. As we now call upon the Lord God this morning, we remember those who are, who are ill, who are struggling, who are struggling especially with fear in the midst of COVID-19, but also that God will help us that we can grow in our faith and our walk with him. Let us call now upon the Lord. Our great God Almighty, we thank you and we praise you for this day. We thank you for the privilege to pause and to worship, to gather, though, in a unique way with your people, a church which at this moment we cannot see what we know exists, brothers and sisters in Christ, sitting, Lord, before a screen, listening to a sermon, singing praises in their living room, or at their kitchen table, or wherever it might be. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us, that wherever we are found, that you never leave us nor forsake us. And we find such tre tremendous comfort in that truth. And so we pray, Lord God, that we might lift up our praise on high to you. We ask, Almighty God, that you will forgive us our sins, that you will cleanse us from unrighteousness, that you will teach us to humble ourselves before you, that you will humble the church who has not spared also the results of the coronavirus, that you will humble our, our nation, you will humble this world. So oftentimes, Lord, we, we see man and all of his, his pomp, his pride, his arrogance, saying, look at what I have done. Look at what I have earned. Look at what I have made. And now, through an invisible, to the naked eye, a virus spread across the world, you've humbled, you've humbled our nation. You've humbled us, Lord. And so we pray in humility that people might look to you, the great creator God. And we thank you for teaching to us that you are a God of providence who upholds and directs all things. As we find tremendous comfort in that truth. That this isn't happening by chance. That this is just a matter of random events. But that you orchestrate this for your own purposes. To bring about your own glory according to your perfect will. So help us, Lord, to submit to that will. To rest upon your will. We pray, Lord God Almighty, that you will continue to sanctify us by your grace. Lead us by your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord God, that you will be with members of our congregations who are struggling. We think of our widows and widowers, our singles, those who are really struggling with loneliness. The days are long, unable to have social interaction. We pray for them. We pray, Lord God, for those families who can be thankful to be together but find that also be, to be a struggle as the different family dynamics can, at times when there's cramped space for prolonged periods of time, we pray that you will give patience to each one of us in this unique situation. We pray for those, Lord, who have the coronavirus or those, Lord, who are near to it, their family members have it. We pray, Father, for the right ability to fight this virus we pray, Lord, that it will not overwhelm the medical system. And we pray, Lord, for 
a restoration, a, either a vaccination or immunity or whatever needs to take place, that life can continue on and economies can begin the process of recovering. We pray for those who are out of work or who have that fear as the essential services continues to become smaller and smaller. We pray, Lord God, that you will provide for your people their daily bread and that they might trust you in this. And we pray for those who work, that they might be generous in the blessings you've given to them, that they may help those who have need. We pray for wisdom for deacons as well to this end. We pray, Lord, for our sister, Alberta, who's in palliative care, and as she grows weaker, struggling with pain, we pray that you will give her peace and heart, and for her husband, Hendrik, we pray for your grace to them. We pray, Lord, for our sister, Bev, as she continues this fight with cancer. We thank you that her checkup yesterday went well, and we pray that you will bless her as she begins once again on Tuesday, uh, chemotherapy. We pray that this will eradicate the cancer from her body. And Lord, that in time, she can look back at this and see your fatherly hand upholding and strengthening her. And be also with her family, Lord. Draw them near to you. Be with those who grieve and mourn. Comfort them. Guide them and keep them. We pray for frontline workers, for paramedics and nurses and doctors and surgeons, for police officers and firefighters, for public servants, for counselors, for those who work in grocery stores, for the many necessary arenas of, of work and service at this time. We pray that you will keep them safe, give them courage for the work, and we thank you for them. We pray for their families as well as each day they come back from work hoping that they have not contracted anything that they could pass on to their families. So Lord, uphold them. We pray that you will be with us this day, that we may sanctify this day, we might rest this day as we worship the living God. We thank you, Lord, and we thank you for this time that we might gather in worship. Hear us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now we sing once again Psalm 116b. Now we're gonna sing verses two, three, and four. I love the Lord, the fount of life and grace. 116b, two, three, and four.
Yeah, what a wonderful comfort it is to sing Psalm 116, a, a psalm which speaks of, of the love of God, but also the finished work of Jesus Christ, the very one who cried out to the Father, cried out to the Father upon the cross, as we'll see in a moment, and God delivered him. And we know that deliverance comes through Easter, the power of the resurrection. Today is Resurrection Day. Let us call upon the Lord now as we prepare to open his word. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that on this Lord's Day, on Palm Sunday, we might stop and reflect upon our Savior, upon his gory death and the horrific irony of what he cried out. For we know, Lord, in the horror of the cross, we find the beauty and majesty and glory of a salvation accomplished by our Savior. Help us to see that this morning. As we open your word, give to us humility and understanding, ears to hear your word, and strengthen your servant that he might faithfully preach. Work in us now, Lord, for your glory and your praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We turn this morning in God's word to Psalm 22. Psalm 22, we'll be looking at the fourth word of the cross, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a direct quote from Psalm 22, verse 1. So our Old Testament reading is Psalm 22. We'll read the entire chapter together. And notice as we read it, notice the transition from verse 21 to 22. It's a significant transition. To the choir master, according to the doe of the dawn, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued and you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. I knew as I cast from my birth, And from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and from my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword. My precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, 
even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. There ends the reading of God's holy word. Let us turn over also to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. We're going to begin our reading at verse 45. Read through verse 40 or 56, but our text this morning is Matthew 27, verse 46. Hear the word of the Lord. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Therefore, or there were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. There ends a reading of God's holy word. Once again, our text this morning is Matthew 27, verse 46. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, this morning we continue our study of the words of the cross. And so we've looked at the first and second words of the cross. We're skipping over the third word of the cross, which is, woman, behold your son. You can find that in John 19, verse 26 and 27. I preached that last year or the year before. So we're skipping on to the fourth word of the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And each of these words of the cross are beautiful and comforting, a balm to the soul, They teach us about God. They teach us about Jesus Christ. And we see him pray to the Father. But I find that it's this fourth word of the cross to be the most difficult to understand. We ask the question, how could God, the Father, forsake his son? The very son who is the God-man. How is that possible? How is that logically possible? How is that covenantally and salvifically possible for the father to forsake the son and take this out a step further and ask the question that's being asked today same question that's been asked through millennia is the question of sin and its results why is there so much suffering why are things so oftentimes difficult why is there so much brokenness and sadness and why so many tears Why war? Why sickness? Why disease? Why so much sin? We've been able to speak about suffering as a result of sin and its consequences, but the times might be quickly coming to our nation where economic suffering takes place. We might understand a new type of suffering over the coming months and years. We understand something about persecution, but we're not living in North Korea or Iran. And yet, the time might be quickly coming. The war, the world rather, is at war with Almighty God. As it has been since the very beginning, since the Garden of Eden, since Genesis chapter 3. And as a Christian now living in this day, in 2020, in the times of the strange COVID-19, 
One's mind must go to the future. One's mind must go to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And is this a sign of the end of the times? Have we arrived? As a Christian, this is a unique time. I'm not saying that this is the final battle. I'm not saying that Christ will return by Christmas of 2020 or something like that. But the final day of the Lord does have signs preceding it. We know this to be sure. We know this was the case, the day of the Lord in 70 AD and the destruction of Jerusalem. But that great and final day of the Lord also has signs, has precursors coming before it. And so the question then is, are you ready? Not simply, will you be ready when that comes, maybe in 20 years, maybe in however long it might be, but are you ready now? living with a readiness and a watchfulness unto the coming of Jesus Christ now. And then what will this battle look like? It won't be pretty. The greatest picture of this battle is the gory cross and then the empty grave. See, the battle, in a sense, has already taken place. The victory has already been grasped. It's already been sustained by Jesus Christ. The victory of Easter morning is the victory of an eternal salvation. And so the future victory was secured by the past victory over sin and over Satan and over death. It's the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Savior had to suffer. And we will too. But our Savior, different than us, had to suffer at the hands of an angry God. So that those who by grace and through faith are trusting in Christ... Do not, have, do not have to suffer at the hands of an angry God. The good news is the good news of Jesus' suffering for us. Our theme this morning is our Lord suffers for us in his humanity. Our Lord suffers for us in his humanity. First, we'll see the irony behind that. Second, the confidence in Jesus' cry. And then third, the comfort that's derived from this. So first, the irony. We look at the context Our text picks up now at the ninth hour of the day. That's three o'clock in the afternoon. A Jewish day begins at six in the morning when the sun comes up. So from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, or from noon to three, it was darkness. And we do have no idea what happened in those three hours. None of the words of Jesus on the cross were happening during those three hours. Nothing is recorded of that time. All we know about it was that it was a time of darkness, pitch black, And so what caused this? What caused this darkness? Was it a solar eclipse? We know that we're at the time of Passover, the night before Jesus celebrated the Passover meal. In 33 AD, there was a solar eclipse in in Palestine, in Israel. But Jesus is being crucified three years before that. It's likely 30 AD. Plus, a solar eclipse is not completely black. It could be a sandstorm. There are sandstorms that come that completely black out the sun. It's as if it's in the middle of the night. And think about being in the middle of the night, not in a city, but if you're out in the country somewhere, all that there's light is the moon and the stars, but they're blacked out too, totally black. Could be. But I think that the most likely explanation for the darkness, a darkness that could be felt from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, is a direct divine act of causing darkness. And it's significant. This darkness is a spiritual sign of danger. It's a spiritual sign of God's displeasure. There's a theme throughout the whole entire scriptures of light and dark, of light being the revelation of God and darkness being the punishment of God. It symbolizes the absence of God's kindness, the absence of God's revelation. Think of when the Israelites left Egypt. There they went and there they came to the Red Sea. And we know that God led them by the pillar of of cloud and fire. But you remember that what separated them from the Egyptians as they're coming to the sea is that on one side of the cloud was light for the Israelites and the other side was darkness. A supernatural darkness, a blackness so that they could not catch up in time. It was God's judgment. In John, Jesus, the light of the world, is the one who brought hope. John the Baptist is the one who came to not be the light but to bear witness about the light. So the whole land now, picture this, the whole land is covered in darkness 
in judgment. It says there now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And then in this situation, in this darkness, this blackness of God's displeasure, Jesus cries out in his native tongue. Jesus says, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. And you might have noticed that if you've read the scriptures enough, in Mark, it's spelled differently. Eloi, Eloi. It adds an O in that word. The word means my God. But those are two different languages. Eli, in our text, and Eloi are two different languages. Eli is Hebrew. Eloi is Aramaic. So literally what it says in our text, these first two words give you something of a Semitic language lesson. Eli, Eli, those are two Hebrew words. Lema sabachthani, that is Aramaic. So these are two different languages in one phrase. And so in the Gospel of Mark, it's all written in the Aramaic. This is likely Jesus, what Jesus said. It was Jesus' native tongue. The reason that Matthew would put this in the Hebrew is because Matthew's purpose in writing this is, is writing this to Old Testament Hebrews, rooting this in Psalm 22, a direct quote from the Old Testament scriptures. Now, Jesus likely would have spoken this in Aramaic. Oftentimes at the end of one's life, they speak their first language I've taken many elders on, on sick visits or on deathbed visits where a saint is only speaking Frisian. I don't speak a word of Frisian, so the elder with me translates for me. Jesus speaks his native language. But you might wonder, it's interesting, there aren't too many Hebrew phrases that make their way into the New Testament. Why this one? Oftentimes, it's just simply a translation. What Jesus is saying, obviously, is not said in English, Yet we translate it into English, fine. But here we have, in the original scriptures, Hebrew. Why? It's because of Psalm 22. It's a quotation from Psalm 22, verse 1. And it's interesting. It's an interesting psalm for Jesus to quote. Because it's a beautiful psalm of God's care for his people. And that that psalm, Psalm 22, which we we probably know it well. It's a well-known song that we sing. We get our song amid the thronging worshipers from that psalm. It's well known to us. But this psalm has two very distinct parts. If you have your Bibles open, turn over to Psalm 22. Let's spend a couple of moments looking at this psalm. This psalm which Jesus quotes on the cross very clearly speaks of Christ, not simply in verse 1, but, but through this first part. You'll see that this is very messianic, pointing ahead to the Messiah, the Savior. Verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Skip down to verse 6. I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. How true, of that, how true is that of our Savior, even on the cross, as he's being mocked? Verse 7, all who see me mock me. They make mouths at me, they wag their heads. They're mocking the Savior. He trusts in the Lord. Verse 8, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. For he delights in him. Skip down to verse 13. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. And poured out like water. All my bones were out of joint. Verse 15. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. He was thirsty. He said I thirst. My tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. Look at verse 19. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. Deliver my soul, verse 20, from the sword. My precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. In that first part of the psalm, very clearly depicting the cross of Jesus Christ. It can also be applied to the sufferings of believers as well. It is a psalm of David. He understood suffering as well. But pointing ahead to Jesus Christ as the final fulfillment of this psalm and then to us. Now we see a transition in verse 22. And the rest of, rest of the psalm is a psalm of praise to the Lord. It's a psalm of a call to worship, really. But the significance here is that the reason that you can have verse 22 and following is because of verse 1 to 21. Because Jesus Christ endured the cross, because Jesus Christ suffered the shame, then I will tell of your name to my brothers. What are you going to tell them? The first 21 verses, Christ has done this for sinners. You who fear the Lord, praise him. 
Why? Because of the cross. Because of his salvation. And so this is the first irony. That Christ uses Psalm 22. As he quotes from the cross. So essentially what we see in the verse, last 10 verses then is our reward. It's the first irony. The second irony is to note that the role of trust in Christ. Jesus Christ trusted the Lord. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Think about that. The very God who protected Jesus, the very God who really, very provided angels to minister to him, in light of Psalm 91, in light of Matthew chapter 4 and Jesus' temptation, that God now assaults the Christ, assaults the Messiah, assaults his beloved son. This cry of our Savior is not a cry, though, of rebellion. It is a cry of trust. My God, my God. And we see here the true humanity of Jesus Christ. This is the word of humanity. Jesus cries out. It seemed like the Father had left him. It seemed like the Father was not there. I've heard this illustration before. I believe it comes from Professor William Hendrickson. But think about a child who is in the intensive care unit. And his parents, he's, he's so sick, that his parents can't go in to visit him. The parents can only see him through a window, but the child can't see the parents and the child might think, why have my parents not come to support me? Why have my parents forsaken me? Yet the mother may have been there 24-7. But like what we are experiencing here, even now in COVID-19, sometimes love involves giving people distance. That's a way to love your neighbor right now. The love of God was never fully taken away from the son. But from the son's perspective, he was in the midst of deep spiritual isolation. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the word of humanity. We know that God, not for one moment, ever ceased to be with Christ. And yet, we see the agony, the cry of our Savior. That's the second irony, trust. The role of trust in Christ. A third irony is the role of the natures of Christ. Is this a battle between, between God and the God-man? Is God suffering on the cross? God does not suffer on the cross. That is an ancient heresy as well. Jesus suffered in his humanity. And this is also why we can say Jesus truly died. We know that God cannot die. And this, this understanding of the two natures of Christ coming together not separated, not divided, not confused, and yet Jesus in his humanity suffering and in his humanity dying, and yet staying united to the Father, we have to admit that there is a mystery to this. There is another ancient heresy, the heresy of docetism. Docetism teaches that at this time on the cross, God left the Son. God left Jesus the man and ceased to be united to him at this point. That view is condemned in church history. However, we do admit here that the suffering of Jesus shows his true humanity. These two natures of Christ, the God, man. Another irony is that Jesus is calling out to God in the midst of suffering, though he himself is sinless. Jesus Christ is calling out to God as if he is receiving the punishment of a sinner, condemned criminal. What's his condemnation, king of the Jews? So the sign above his head read, yet he himself committed no sin. Christ could no longer see the perfect justice and mercy of God. I'm sure you can read into our text that Jesus does not say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's not whispering. Our text says he cried out with a loud voice, my God, my God. At the point of death, crying out with his all, with his everything. This is the one for whom the scripture said, he who knew no sin became sin for sinners. That he became sin for us. On the Christ, God is punishing sin. 
Sin is punished in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not the case then that God hates the sin but loves the sinner. That might sound nice, might probably sound politically correct, but it's false. God does not punish simply the sins that Jesus took to himself, but he punishes Jesus himself. God punishes sinners. There's not that distinction. Unless one is found and resting in Jesus Christ for their salvation, they are still then in their sin. Unless they are resting in Christ, they are not living with those who have hope. They will be forsaken by God truly and eternally unless they turn to Christ. Let the prospect of hell leave you longing that much more for heaven. The expression of God's punishment against sin is the fact that he will punish sinners. Jesus cries out in the midst as a suffering sinner, though he himself was sinless. A fifth irony we saw briefly is that there is darkness covering the whole land for three hours. Why is that ironic? Well, the irony is that this is caused by what's happening to Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ is the very light of the nations. Jesus suffering on the cross is essentially then removing the darkness From noon to three o'clock, utter darkness covering the land. Jesus Christ is taking that darkness, that judgment of God upon himself. And this beautiful imagery then of, of darkness and light, which John really focuses upon, is accomplished and makes sense because Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He's the one who brought light amidst darkness. A sixth irony here is the fact that God is going to bring life through death. Just as Israel had to pass through the Red Sea, which was death for the Egyptians, right? The the sea was death. The Israelites had to pass through the Red Sea so that they could live on the other side, so that they could have a new life. Just as the foreskin had to be cut in circumcision, picturing of a cutting off of the world, picturing covenantal atonement, Just as we have to be visibly drowned in baptism, buried with Christ, Romans 4 says, in baptism, in order to live a new life in Christ, so God, too, will bring life through death. It's always been the case. Ever since sin came into the world, that life could only be accomplished through death. We see this explained well in Lord's Day 15 and Lord's Day 16 of the Heidelberg Catechism where we deal with the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. Christ's death was altogether different than our death will be. Christ's death gives us life amidst our death. So that even though we die, yet we we shall live, that's only because of the cross. That's only because of what our Savior is accomplishing here. The cross of Christ was full of horrific irony. Second, we see confidence We know that the cry of our Savior was intense. He was at the final hour of his life. And it's surprising to me that he even had the strength to to fill his lungs with air to cry this phrase out. But his cry to God, his Father, was not a cry of rebellion. Our Lord Jesus Christ stayed and remained sinless through this whole process. Rather this, though emotional, human, And powerful of a cry it was, it was a cry of confidence. After all, he calls him my God. My God, and quoting Psalm 22. This is a confession of confidence. Three times in the cross, our Lord Jesus Christ prays to the Father, or cries out to the Father. Two times he uses the word Father, and then this time he uses the phrase, my God, my God. Jesus did not doubt the plan of God. Jesus did not think then at the ninth hour, darkness covering the earth. No, on second thought, God, you have this all wrong. We should stop this now. Not at all. Jesus did not forget the plan of redemption. Jesus did not lose control. That's key. That's extremely important. We oftentimes have a wrong view that Jesus is a passive victim upon the cross. 
And even though he stood as a sheep before its shears is silent, before Pilate, Jesus was not passive in any way upon the cross. We think of these things simply as happening to him. But Jesus is not passive. Scripture paints a very different picture of the Savior. Let me show you, show you this. If you have your Bibles open, turn over to Luke. We'll just see how Luke describes this. Because Luke has a theme. And if, if, you, if you take your time, we'll just take a few moments. But if you take your time looking through Luke, you can see that Jesus is marching to the cross very purposely. And the transition in the Gospel of Luke is in chapter 9, verse 51. Look there in your Bibles. 9, verse 51 is where it changes. And then each chapter after that, it seems, Jesus bring up the fact on his way to Jerusalem, as he's going to Jerusalem. Well, what's in Jerusalem? The cross. The cross. This holy week of which we now have begun. 9, verse 51. And when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. That's not a passive plan of travel. That's active. Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. Just like Aslan the lion and the lion witch in the wardrobe willingly went to the stone table. Not passively, but actively. In Luke 13 verse 22, Jesus was teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Luke 17 verse 11, now on his way to Jerusalem. Luke 18, look there at verse 31. Verse 31 says of Luke 18, And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, will be mocked, and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. That's not passive. That's the active atonement of Jesus Christ. This is the same one who John chapter 10 verse 18 says, Jesus says, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. No one takes Jesus' life. He gives his life. He offers his life as the final sacrifice, the final Lamb of God. Jesus confidently on Palm Sunday, which is today, rode into Jerusalem. And on Good Friday, Jesus confidently cried out the words of our text, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew God's plan, and it was good. Everything Jesus does, including his prayer of agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, testified to that truth. This is the prayer of confidence because Jesus set his face to Jerusalem. Which brings us thirdly to our comfort. The tremendous comfort to take away from our text is found in the fact that Jesus was forsaken by God so that we do not have to be forsaken by God. And Jesus, the word used in our text is forsaken. It means literally to abandon, to leave. Now what would make God abandon Jesus on the cross? Or at least what, what would make it so that Jesus felt that God had abandoned him on the cross? Two reasons primarily why. Here's the first reason. Let me read it from the Bible. It says this. Here's the reason why God forsook the Son. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. You might recognize that passage. It's taken from Genesis 3, 3.15. It's the first promise of the Messiah. Jesus needed to suffer the strike of Satan. Jesus needed the seed of the serpent, Satan, to strike the heel of the seed of the woman brought on by God himself. He needed to fulfill the scriptures. A second reason is because Christ shouldered the curse that was to fall upon us. Cursed is anyone who's hung from a tree. Jesus received the curse of sin, the curse of the fall, in our place. And if you're trusting in Jesus Christ, this is true for you. And if you're not trusting in Jesus Christ as you hear this, 
if you're hearing this in unbelief, then you still live under the curse. Think of the comparison made in Romans 5 between, between Adam and the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Both represented us, but only one was able to bring us salvation. What a tremendous comfort then it becomes for the child of God that Jesus cried out in our, in our text, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know why that's such a tremendous comfort? Because if Jesus didn't say that, that at some point in the future, we would have to say that. We would have to actually be forsaken by God eternally. But because Jesus said this, though undeserving of it, we have in his finished work a glorious salvation. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We think, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, that you said that. That we know our curse has been removed because he hung there on that cross in our place. A further comfort which flows from that then is the satisfaction that Christ has accomplished. What Christ did, what the scriptures had demanded, Christ fulfilled all righteousness. Christ accomplished what the prophets said that that he would do. He was rejected. He was killed. And the killed one is the one that Isaiah called Emmanuel, God with us. And the last hour of his life, as his breath is slowing down, as he's nearing the end, Jesus speaks these words of humanity. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a question. We know the answer to this fourth question of the cross, to this fourth word of the cross. He was forsaken by God so that we might be accepted by him. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. In what he cried on the cross, you can say that he cried for you. Is this your savior? Was he killed in your place? And if not, repent and believe while you still can and receive the reward won for us by this glorious savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus cries out in fulfillment of scripture, in fulfillment of prophecy, and Jesus cries out to the comfort, to the peace of hearts for those who are now called the children of God. Believe in the Lord and you will be saved. Amen. Let us thank the Lord God with a prayer of application. Let us pray. Father Almighty, we thank you for these words of our Savior, these words of agony, of humanity, but these words of salvation. We pray, Lord, that you will strengthen our faith in our Savior. And Lord, if we're listening to this without faith, give that to us, that we might pray simply, Father, forgive us sinners, remove our sin from us, and give us the righteousness of Christ. Give to us a new life by the power of your Spirit, that we might live all the days of our life in sweet fellowship and communion with you, our faithful God. Give that to each one of us, and may every one of us daily repent and believe in this Savior. Apply your word to our hearts. May, may, may it be known to us, Lord, in our heart of hearts, that in the midst of this situation, we have the answer to the questions of life, and the answer is found in the Savior on the cross for us. Hear us, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Our song of response is number 352, Man of Sorrows, What a Name, 352. And if you'd like, you may stand to sing.
receive now the parting blessing of the Lord. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.